Welcome to Self-Care and How to Live a Healthy Life. I'm Sofia Rodriguez, and today we are diving into the art of self-care and its profound impact on our overall well-being. From mindfulness to nutrition, we'll explore the practices that can transform your life for the better. Let's embark on this journey together towards a healthier and more fulfilling lifestyle. Thanks, Sophia. It's a pleasure to join you today. To start, let's unpack the concept of self-care a bit more. Many people think it's all about indulging in a spa day or treating themselves to something expensive, but it's really much deeper than that, isn't it? Absolutely, Dr. Green. When we talk about self-care, we're not just discussing occasional treats. It's about the daily practices and habits that contribute to our long-term health and wellness. For example, regular exercise is a fundamental aspect of self-care that can dramatically improve physical and mental health. Right, Maxwell. And to add to that, nutrition plays a crucial role as well. What we put into our bodies directly impacts how we feel, our energy levels, and even our mental clarity. Combining a balanced diet with physical activity is like a one-two punch in the self-care routine. Speaking of mental clarity, let's not forget the psychological aspects of self-care. Activities like journaling, meditation, and even simple breathing exercises can significantly reduce stress and improve our overall emotional well-being. I'd love to dive a bit deeper into the exercise component, if that's okay. There's a common misconception that exercise has to be intense or time-consuming to be effective, but research shows that even short bouts of moderate exercise, like a brisk 10-minute walk, can have tremendous benefits. That's a fantastic point, Maxwell. It ties back to the idea that self-care should be accessible and manageable. Not everyone has the time or resources for a 90-minute yoga session or a trip to the gym, but most of us can find 10 minutes to take a walk or do some stretching at home. And let's not overlook the importance of sleep in our self-care routine. It's the foundation of good health, yet so many people struggle with getting enough quality sleep. Absolutely, Dr. Green. Sleep affects everything from our physical health, like weight management and immune function, to our mental health, including our mood and cognitive abilities. Developing good sleep hygiene is a crucial self-care strategy. This conversation really highlights how interconnected all aspects of self-care are. Physical activity, nutrition, mindfulness, and sleep. They all feed into each other to create a holistic approach to wellness. Exactly, Sophia. And it's important for our listeners to remember that self-care is a personal journey. What works for one person may not work for another. It's all about finding what practices best suit your lifestyle and needs. So true. It's about experimenting and being open to adapting your self-care routines as your life changes. The goal is to find a balance that allows you to thrive physically, mentally, and emotionally. Picking up on that point about balance, it's also crucial to mention the role of hydration in self-care. Drinking enough water can impact our energy levels, brain function, and even our mood. It's a simple yet often overlooked aspect of health. Absolutely, Sophia. The benefits of staying hydrated cannot be overstated. In fact, dehydration can mimic symptoms of anxiety and depression, such as headache, fatigue, and difficulty concentrating. It's fascinating how something as simple as drinking water can have such a profound impact on our well-being. That's a mind-blowing connection. It really puts into perspective how our physical health is so deeply intertwined with our mental health. It's like you can't truly address one without considering the other. And it's not just about what we do physically. What we put into our bodies matters too. Nutrition plays a massive role in self-care. Eating a balanced diet rich in fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, and healthy fats can boost our mood, energy levels, and overall health. Speaking of nutrition, the concept of food as medicine is gaining traction. Research is increasingly showing how certain foods can positively impact mental health, such as omega-3 fatty acids found in fish, reducing symptoms of depression. That's fascinating, Dr. Green. It really emphasizes the point that self-care isn't just a trend. It's a comprehensive lifestyle that encompasses everything from our diet and physical activity 
to our sleep and hydration habits. It also underscores the importance of listening to our bodies and being mindful of our needs. Sometimes something as simple as eating a nutritious meal or going for a walk can be exactly what we need to reset and recharge. I couldn't agree more, Sophia. And this ties back to the idea of self-care being a highly individualized practice. It's about tuning into your body and mind, recognizing your needs, and responding in the most nurturing way possible. Building on that, let's dive a bit deeper into the emotional aspect of self-care. Many people overlook the importance of emotional health, focusing solely on the physical. How can addressing our emotional health contribute to a healthier life? That's a great question, Maxwell. Emotional self-care is just as important as physical care. Activities like journaling, as mentioned, can be incredibly therapeutic. They allow us to process our thoughts and emotions in a safe, controlled environment, fostering a deeper understanding of ourselves. Absolutely, Sophia. And therapy or counseling should never be underestimated. Having a professional guide you through your emotions and thoughts can provide clarity and coping strategies that bolster overall emotional resilience. Right, Dr. Green. It's really about having a toolbox of strategies, isn't it? From mindfulness to meditation, there are so many ways to enhance emotional well-being. But how can someone identify which practices will work best for them? Experimentation and patience are key, Maxwell. What works for one person might not work for another. It's important to try different strategies and see how you respond. Keeping an open mind and being willing to adjust is vital. And let's not forget the science behind mindfulness and meditation. Studies have shown that these practices can literally change the structure of the brain, leading to reduced stress, improved emotional regulation, and even enhanced concentration. That's incredible, Dr. Green. It highlights the power of taking proactive steps towards emotional self-care. It's not just about feeling better in the moment, but initiating profound and lasting changes in our mental health. And those changes can lead to improvements in physical health as well. It's all interconnected. Lower stress levels can lead to lower blood pressure, better sleep, and improved immune function. The body responds positively to a peaceful mind. It certainly does, Sophia. The mind-body connection is a fascinating aspect of holistic wellness. Recognizing and nurturing this connection through self-care practices can lead to a more balanced and fulfilling life. Speaking of balance, it's interesting to see how integrating mental self-care into our daily routines can also enhance our productivity and creativity. Do you think there's a direct link between mental self-care practices and an increase in creative output? Absolutely, Maxwell. When we engage in activities that relax the mind and reduce stress, like meditation or even taking a short walk, we're essentially giving our brain the opportunity to reset. This can lead to an increase in creativity and new ideas as our mind is freed from the clutter of stress. That's a great point, Sophia. There's also scientific evidence to support this. For instance, a study found that people who engage in regular physical activity, which is a form of self-care, tend to have better cognitive flexibility. This means they're better at switching between tasks and coming up with innovative solutions. So it sounds like by taking care of our mental well-being, we're not just improving our health, but we're also setting the stage for greater efficiency and innovation in our work and personal projects. Exactly, Maxwell. And it doesn't have to be something time-consuming or complicated. Simple habits, like setting aside time to read a book or learn something new, can have significant benefits for our mental agility and overall well-being. The key is making it a consistent part of our lives. Much like physical exercise, the benefits of mental self-care activities are cumulative. Starting small and gradually incorporating more practices as they become habit is an effective strategy for lasting change. That's really encouraging to hear. It seems like with a little effort and commitment, anyone can start reaping the benefits of mental self-care. Accessibility is crucial, especially for those who might feel overwhelmed by the idea of implementing new routines. Absolutely. 
And let's not forget the role of community and social connections in mental self-care. Engaging in group activities, whether it's a book club, a sport, or just regular catch-ups with friends, can provide a significant boost to our mental health. Indeed, Sophia. Social support not only provides a sense of belonging, but also acts as a buffer against stress. Cultivating strong relationships is, without a doubt, a fundamental aspect of self-care that contributes to a healthy and balanced life. That brings us to a really interesting aspect of self-care that often gets overlooked, setting boundaries. It's vital for maintaining our overall well-being, but it's something many of us struggle with. How do you see boundary setting fitting into this conversation? Oh, boundary setting is crucial. It's about recognizing our limits and communicating them clearly to others. This not only helps prevent burnout, but also ensures we have the energy and space to engage in those self-care practices we've been talking about. That's an excellent point, Sophia. There's psychological evidence suggesting that people who are good at setting boundaries tend to have better mental health outcomes. It's like creating a protective bubble around your well-being. Knowing when to say no is a superpower in itself. It's funny you mention that, Dr. Green. Many of my clients initially feel guilty about setting boundaries as if it's a form of selfishness. But when they start seeing the positive impact on their lives, their perspective shifts. It's about self-respect, not selfishness. Exactly, Maxwell. It's about giving yourself permission to prioritize your needs. And when it comes to implementing this, it can be as simple as saying, I need some time for myself, or I can't commit to this right now. Small steps, but incredibly empowering. And it's not just about saying no to others. It's also about setting boundaries with ourselves, recognizing when we're pushing too hard or setting unrealistic expectations. Self-compassion plays a big part in this. That's a great insight, Dr. Green. It ties back to the idea of mental self-care and recognizing our limits. It's about balance and understanding it's okay not to be on full throttle all the time. And remember, setting boundaries can also positively impact our relationships. It teaches others how we want to be treated and establishes a foundation of mutual respect. It's a key aspect of healthy, balanced interactions. Absolutely, Sophia. It enhances our well-being and the quality of our interactions. When we're clear about our boundaries, it sets the tone for our relationships and helps us connect with others in a more meaningful way. Moving to the topic of self-compassion, I think it's fascinating how it's intertwined with the concept of boundary setting. Treating ourselves with kindness means acknowledging when we need a break and not beating ourselves up for it. Oh, absolutely, Maxwell. Self-compassion is all about being your own best friend. It's about speaking to yourself with the same kindness and understanding that you'd offer to a good friend who's going through a tough time. That's a vital point, Sophia. Research actually shows that self-compassion can lead to lower levels of anxiety and depression. When we're kind to ourselves, we're essentially telling our mind and body that it's okay to be imperfect. It's interesting how society often glorifies the hustle and overlooks the importance of rest and self-care. There's this underlying implication that taking breaks is a sign of weakness, which couldn't be further from the truth. Exactly, Maxwell. The hustle culture can be quite toxic. It's, it's like we're in a constant competition with ourselves to prove how productive we can be, which just leads to burnout. Embracing self-compassion is like giving ourselves permission to step off the treadmill and catch our breath. And let's not forget the role of mindfulness in practicing self-compassion. Being present in the moment and acknowledging our feelings without judgment is crucial. It allows us to understand our needs and address them with kindness. Mindfulness, yes! It's like hitting the pause button on life's remote control. It gives us the space to reflect on our actions and thoughts, which is essential for fostering a compassionate relationship with ourselves. Incorporating mindfulness and self-compassion into daily routines doesn't have to be complicated. Simple acts like taking a few deep breaths, enjoying a cup of tea, or journaling can make a big difference in how we treat ourselves. 
Absolutely, Sophia. It's those small everyday actions that build up over time to create a more compassionate and understanding relationship with ourselves. It's about taking the time to nurture our well-being, just as we would for someone we care about deeply. Speaking of nurturing well-being, that loops us right into the importance of social connections in our lives. There's solid evidence linking strong, supportive relationships with better health outcomes. It's not just about having people around. It's about having the right people around. That's so true, Maxwell. And it's not just about buffering stress or having a shoulder to cry on. Positive social connections can actually influence our long-term health, reducing the risk of depression, high blood pressure, and even early death. And there's an interesting angle to this as well. It's bi-directional. While having strong social support can lead to better health outcomes, engaging in healthy behaviors can also attract and cultivate stronger social bonds. It's like a positive feedback loop. Right. Engaging in activities together, like exercise classes, hiking, or even cooking healthy meals with friends or family can strengthen bonds. It's the shared experiences that bring us closer and contribute to our well-being. It's fascinating how these shared activities not only strengthen our bonds, but also contribute to our self-care practices. It's like hitting two birds with one stone. Engaging in physical activities or mindful eating with others can make these practices more enjoyable and sustainable. Absolutely. And let's not underestimate the power of simply being there for each other. Sometimes the best form of support is just listening. Offering a non-judgmental ear and presence can be incredibly healing. It's a reminder of the old adage, a problem shared is a problem halved. Having someone to talk to can lighten the burden, making life's challenges seem more manageable. It underscores the importance of cultivating meaningful connections. True, and it's essential to remember that maintaining these relationships requires effort and mutual respect. It's about giving as much as you take. Reciprocity is key in building and sustaining supportive social networks. And in today's digital world, it's easier than ever to stay connected. But it's the quality of these connections that truly matters. Prioritizing face-to-face -face interactions or even voice calls over texts can make a significant difference in the depth of our relationships. That's a solid point, Dr. Green. The convenience of digital communication is undeniable, but it often lacks the emotional richness of face-to-face -face conversations. There's something about seeing someone's expressions, their body language, that can't be replicated through a screen. Absolutely, Maxwell. And this brings us to the concept of digital detoxing as a form of self-care. Occasionally, disconnecting from our devices allows us to reconnect with ourselves and others on a deeper level. It's about finding that balance. Speaking of balance, the discussion on managing stress wouldn't be complete without touching on the role of mindfulness and meditation. These practices can significantly reduce stress levels by bringing our attention back to the present and reducing rumination. Indeed, Dr. Green. And the beauty of mindfulness is that it can be practiced anywhere, at any time. You don't need any special equipment or a lot of time. It's about cultivating a habit of being present and aware, which in turn can transform our approach to life's stresses. And let's not forget about the physical aspect of stress management. Regular physical activity is proven to reduce stress hormones like cortisol and stimulate the production of endorphins, our body's natural painkillers and mood elevators. Right, Sophia. And it's not just high-intensity exercise that has this effect. Gentle, restorative movements like yoga or even a leisurely walk in nature can be incredibly beneficial for mental health. This ties back to finding an activity that you enjoy and can stick with. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to exercise. It's about what makes you feel good and what you can incorporate into your routine consistently. And when you find those activities, it's like unlocking a new level of well-being. It's amazing how our bodies and minds are so interconnected. A shift in one area often leads to positive changes in another. Absolutely. The mind-body connection is a powerful tool in our self-care arsenal. 
and recognizing the signals our bodies send us can help us better manage stress and increase our overall well-being. Speaking of recognizing signals, let's dive into the importance of regular checkups. Regular visits to your healthcare provider are a key component of preventive healthcare. How do you all integrate this into your self-care routines? That's a great point, Dr. Green. As a personal trainer, I always encourage my clients to get regular checkups. It's not just about monitoring for potential health issues, but also about getting a baseline for where you are health-wise. Knowing your numbers, like blood pressure and cholesterol levels, can inform how you tailor your fitness and nutrition plans. From a nutritional standpoint, regular checkups can provide invaluable insights into how your body is responding to your diet. For instance, if you're deficient in certain vitamins or nutrients, this can significantly impact your energy levels and overall health. Regular blood tests can guide your dietary choices, ensuring you're getting what your body needs. Indeed, and let's not overlook the psychological benefits. Knowing that you're taking proactive steps to care for your health can alleviate anxiety and stress. It gives a sense of control and agency over one's health journey. That's very true. It also fosters a partnership between you and your healthcare provider. You're working together to monitor and maintain your health, which can be incredibly empowering. And with advances in telehealth and digital healthcare platforms, it's easier than ever to stay on top of these checkups and consultations, making it a seamless part of self-care routines. Absolutely. The accessibility of healthcare has definitely improved, allowing more people to prioritize their health without it feeling like a chore. It's about integrating these practices into our lives in a way that feels natural and supportive of our overall well-being. Right. It's all about building a lifestyle that naturally incorporates self-care practices, from mindfulness and nutrition to physical activity and regular checkups. And as we've discussed, it's these small, consistent actions that lead to significant long-term benefits. Taking care of ourselves is an ongoing journey, not a destination. Well said, Sophia. I think that's a perfect note to end on. It's clear that self-care is multifaceted, involving physical, mental, and emotional health. Regular checkups are a critical part of this holistic approach, ensuring we stay informed and proactive about our health. Thank you, Maxwell and Sophia, for sharing your insights and expertise. And to our listeners, remember to prioritize yourself and your well-being. Your health is your greatest asset.